Support for the Forward's Bintel Brief podcast comes from listeners like you and from Edward Blank, whose generosity makes this program possible. Hello, I am Lynn Harris, and I am definitely more nearsighted than you. (laughs) That's a low bar, actually, for me. I'm not too blind. But I'm Gina Green, everybody. And uh, today we have an interesting, potentially controversial episode. To be doing it in my linen closet feels a little wonky, but uh, I'm ready to get into it. This is how we live now, Gina. (laughs) In our closets. So many people fought for the right to not be in it. And here I am (laughs) in here with you. Uh, but we are going to have a great conversation today. Welcome to A Bental Brief, the podcast. Dear Bental, I'm the mother of two kids who are now in high school and college, respectively. We sent them to Jewish camp, and now that they're older, they say we and the camp lied to them about Israel. I suppose I have sinned by omission. Israel's government and treatment of its non-Jewish population make me very uncomfortable. But I also see Israel as the Jewish homeland. And I grew up in a time when support for Israel, while also complaining about Israel, was a given. Now what? Signed, unhappy camper. Well, well, this one's easy. <laughs> <laughs> and we can tell you that there are a lot of people in that bunk with unhappy camper. Oh, yeah. Yep. She is not alone at all in either believing that Israel is the Jewish homeland in its modern incarnation is the Jewish homeland and that it does things right and it does things wrong. And you can complain it like that is something that is true. Yeah. A lot of people who are going to camp or now entering the world and have been to camp and day schools and experience the whole of <laughs> Jewish life in the United States, quite frankly, and feel that they've been lied to by their forebears about the land, the state, the people, the conflict, you name it. Yeah. Unhappy camper. You are not alone. And whenever I say you are not alone, I always want to sing that Michael Jackson song. Like, I always want to sing it. Oh. You, you are not alone. Oh, you go, I Michael. I always want to do that. I go, Evan Hansen. You are not alone. Oh. You are not alone. Yep. So, Unhappy Camper, we're here for you on the very first score. You should know that this is, in so many ways, it feels like a very universal question for Jewish parents. Yeah, I would go so far as to say that it's not just that unhappy campers not alone. I feel like this letter is the expression of a generation. Like that this is huge. This is the voice of a part of this generation, which I'm going to guess is around based on the math around Gen X, right? The parent. Yep. And um those of us and I include myself who I didn't go to Jewish camp, but went to Hebrew school through high school, went to Israel many times as a child as an and an adult. I have cousins in Israel, the whole thing. And um, I I could have written this letter if I <laughs> if I had those kids. In other words, from the I m- I match with the experience of unhappy camper in that you know my experience was you know the glory of having a you know a sovereign state um, that is ours you know in that sense in that sense uh, you know and I'm you know I, I you know I realized that what I just said ours is complicated but this is I'm just painting a picture of then we put you know we put we gave money to to plant trees in Israel. Um, we got excited to maybe get to go there after our name, B'nai Mitzvah as a, as a gift, you know, um, we visited and knew of all the places, but and that we thought were all the places mm. and they weren't all the places and it wasn't all the things and it wasn't just trees, but no one said that. So I heard something in mono that should have been in stereo. And so I totally relate to this and I relate to it as a parent as well. And I think what Unhappy Camper is lifting up here too are issues even bigger than Israel, even bigger than the mm-hmm. state, even bigger than the conflict, right? I mm-hmm. mean, there is like at the core of this is being a parent. Yeah. Right. And what it, means to feel like you've let your kid down, even if you don't think you did, or even if you actually didn't. But Mm -hmm. if that's what 
they're feeling. There is a lot wrapped up in that. When I read Unhappy Camper's letter, I feel like there is the sort of substantive concern about how do we talk about Israel? How do we talk about our homeland? How do we talk about a place that is also a homeland for other people? And how do I not let my kids down? How do I keep them from feeling as if I have let them down? That's got a that's a that's a big weight. You know, there is that shared experience by many, not all of us, of the narrative that we got. We can't change that. And I, I love how I love how she ended the question, which is now what? What she's really asking is how do we move forward from here as opposed to how do we fix the past? You know, you said that there were so many places to situate oneself on that spectrum of activism related to, to Israel. And I think it's true because some of that activism is born out of a commitment and belief in the Jewish homeland. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Some of it is born out of a commitment and belief in humanity and a respect for all peoples and has less to do with Israel as a homeland or as a nation state. And so there is so much wrapped up in how people are showing up, if you will. I mean, obviously we've been talking about it for the last few minutes. I think that the generational divide is one that colors both the narrative that we have told ourselves and have shaped ourselves and also our understanding of the facts. Over time, history gets shaped as it's being Mm -hmm. made, right? And it continues to be shaped and altered even after it's making. And it is really hard to sometimes have conversation, sometimes avoid sinning Mm -hmm. by omission, such as Unhappy Camper wrote, when there's a disagreement on the Mm -hmm. facts and a disagreement on the narrative, and when the narrative and the facts don't always align. Right. And that's happened at four different generations over the last 50 years. Right. We will be right back after this quick break. Are you looking for insightful and heartfelt conversations about social justice, activism, and innovation? I am. And that's why I am glad to recommend the podcast All Inclusive with Jay Ruderman. Jay is president of the Ruderman Family Foundation, a social activist, and a philanthropic leader in diversity and social justice. Every other Monday, you should definitely join Jay as he interviews leaders and experts on the latest news, technology, and advocacy for a more socially just world. You can hear conversations with leaders like PBS NewsHour's Judy Woodruff as she discusses her remarkable career in journalism and her work in disability advocacy. You can hear Curb Your Enthusiasm Cheryl Hines on inclusion in Hollywood. You can hear Harvard University President Lawrence Bakow dig into topics like mental health and racial injustice on campus. And you can hear Darren Walker, president of the Ford Foundation, talk about the importance of social activism. All Inclusive will inspire you to keep learning and take actions that help build that positive future. Listen and subscribe. Don't forget to subscribe to All Inclusive wherever you're listening right now. Unhappy Camper didn't ask us to debate the Israel-Palestine conflict. So we are not bringing you a panel with representatives across some political spectrum. What we are here to do is help her help her kids recover from this feeling of betrayal and figure out how to feel about Israel and the conflict now. So we reached out to encounter a group with a strong point of view, which is that American Jews need to learn more about Palestinians and understand their perspectives. Before the pandemic, Encounter had taken thousands of American Jews to the West Bank to hear the Palestinian story from Palestinians, often in their homes. Many of the people who go on Encounter trips seek them out precisely because they are upset at what they see as major gaps in the Israel education they received at camp or synagogue. Others get angry while they're on the trips that they have never before heard the stories they hear in those Palestinian homes. And so our guests, Yona Shemtov and Leah Solomon, are constantly dealing with exactly the dilemma unhappy camper is facing. Can you hold both a love for Israel as a Jewish homeland and true commitment to Palestinian human rights? We are super excited to have you here today. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Before we dive in to camp and Israel and lies, uh, can you explain Encounter's mission for everyone listening who might not be familiar with it yet? Sure. Um, Encounter is an educational organization that's focused really on kind of helping the Jewish communal landscape deal with exactly this question. How might we integrate a wider lens in how we interact with Israel and specifically the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? 
in a way that upholds our Jewish values and is rigorously honest, but not smashing of Jewish identity. Do you have like initial gut reactions, either of you, to this letter? I'm sure the themes are familiar. Um, what's What did it first make you think of? What's at top of your head? The question hits close to home. I have a teenage stepdaughter on an Israel program right now. That's a program of her camp that's culminated in a trip in Israel. Um, and my amazing stepson is going to be in Israel for the year on your course this coming September. And both of them have raised the exact same complaint, question, concern, et cetera. So I feel like it's a live issue in our household as well. So I would say the first reaction that comes to mind is just that it really resonates. You know, unlike Yona, my kids are growing up in Israel. And so it's a little bit different. And yet I think it's actually very similar. This is not an issue that they speak about in school. It's not an issue that my son who went to camp where he was the Israeli kid, it wasn't something they spoke about. And it's something that I have heard over and over and over, even from many rabbinical students that we worked with for years. The only thing that I would add is that, you know, your your questioner said they feel like they were lied to. And I think that that is, while I understand why people feel that they were lied to, I think it's a case of people really feeling like they don't have the tools to do this in a way that will support young people to both feel connected to, to care about Israel, to care about Israelis, and also to be able to engage in a critical way with what's happening on the ground. I first want to take the pressure off the parent for a moment and say, there's actually a systems issue. And at the same time, I think it's time for us as a community to bring a little bit of a loving critique and self-assessment of how have we succeeded and how might we have failed or have room for improvement and how we've approached teaching about this issue from a systems perspective. Sometimes there are actually what's, you know, the Hasbara push, which is really more about a public relations defense of Israel happening. And that finds its way often in expression in curriculum that camps and in schools and in youth movements. And I think part of the blowback that we're seeing from this millennial generation and Gen Z is a pushback against that, actually, saying there's a political agenda there and it has infiltrated education and you haven't been honest with us about that. Her question is really a text and a larger communal story um, that has lacked, I think, um, an updated space for creative and courageous thought leadership on what creative and courageous Israel education could look like on this issue. And that's kind of what we're trying to address. So, Yona, let me ask this then. Every decision point has pros and cons. What are we afraid of as a Jewish community? Are we afraid of anything in the Jewish community when we don't have the honest transparent, real conversations? And what is the price we pay for that? Yes. Well, one thing specifically, I'm going to take that question, if it's okay with you, to the individual parent, because I identify with the question. And I want to say to the parent, they've done a good job, right? As parents, we also sort of are our harshest critics. But, you know, you have two kids that are coming back to you with frustration. And to me, I really do feel like frustration, you know, is a wish that has not been met. Right. There's a sense of ownership and attachment that's being expressed through that frustration, a love of community, a love of Israel and a sort of now feeling frustrated. Well, it's not what I thought it was. And there's an embedded wish of like, help me reconcile this. Help me make sense of this. So I think to the listener and to all of us, when we see those expressions of frustration, you know, to bring a parenting lens to it, this is about a long term relationship with Israel, with the Jewish community, right? Integrity and integration doesn't happen in a second. This is about a practice over a period of time. And so I think the way in which we as parents and as communal institutions respond to the pushback is very critical, right? It's not the mistake that matters, it's how we respond. So I think just for the parent in particular, I would encourage them not to throw up their hands, actually, but to triple down and lean in. Right. I think also one of the things that's missing is being in Israel, going to Israel. I think there's a way in which um, we're having this conversation often as American Jews, and it's an intellectual exercise 
And often what we're talking about when we talk about Israel is in Israel. We're talking about our anxieties about Jewish identity. Um, and so I think it's very important to root people to the place. And when you're there um, in person, but also when you're exposing people to culture, language, you know, music, to make sure that Palestinians are part of that exposure. That's like first and foremost, 101. Um, and to your point around what gets, like, what's the cost benefit analysis? You know, what are we afraid of? Of course, there's no one community. In our own community, there's so many multiple communities that are coexisting. And each community has its own attachment and attachment issues um, with Israel, right? So I think outside of the modern Orthodox community, for the most part, there is, and these are obviously gross generalizations, so we can correct for those. But for the most part, outside of the modern Orthodox community, there is a waning attachment amongst younger generations with Israel and understanding why, why was there the creation of a homeland and this idea of Israel as a colonialist project and grappling with intersectionality. I think the fear of going there, leaning into the issues of bringing in Palestinian voices, et cetera, is that um, it may upend the entire house of cards. Well, if we go there, perhaps they're going to opt out. They're going to be anti, anti-Israel, anti-Jewish. They're going to walk away from the whole project. Um, that belies an anxiety, right? A real anxiety. And I think it also belies that we have not cultivated a strong enough, resilient um, Jewish education that can hold for those complexities. What could creative and courageous Jewish education look like then? I want to respond to that question by picking up where Yona left off to sort of say what Yona was just saying in, in a slightly different way. If we really allow ourselves to criticize and critique Israel's policies, Israel's government, even the way the state is currently structured in the West Bank and with Gaza, the cost is going to be that our young people will turn away. I think baked into that assumption which might not be a true assumption, right? Because as Yona pointed out, sometimes it's actually exactly the opposite. Not telling them is what causes them to turn away. But I think what's baked into that assumption is that this is, 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 a, is a binary view of the situation, which is a false binary. The binary that we get stuck in so often, both as parents and as educators, is the idea that supporting Israel, being loyal to Israel means supporting what Israel does, it means supporting Israel's policies. And we also, I think, unspoken often assume that it means being in some ways or another anti-Palestinian, mm -hmm. that Jews being pro-Jewish means being anti-Palestinian and being pro-Palestinian means being anti-Jewish, being anti-Israel, and that we can't hold both of those at once. And that's actually a cost of not, I think it's not the cost that we're thinking about, we educators or parents, when we don't really dive into the, the realities on the ground. Um, but that's the real cost, is kind of moving forward with this assumption that we have to see this as us and them. We have to see this as a zero-sum game. And the real reframe, just to go to your question, Lynn, about what does it mean, creative, courageous Jewish education and Israel education, is to, to flip that narrative on its head and to say, caring about Israel, being connected to Israel, supporting Israel necessarily means acknowledging that reality. And it means caring about Palestinians too, because they are, as Yona said, an, an integral part of our reality. They're an integral part of our story. They're not going anywhere. They are an integral part of our future. And so if we really care about the future of Israel, we really care about supporting Israel, Part of that means caring about Palestinians and caring about a shared future for both Palestinians and Israelis that will ensure justice and equality and freedom and security for everyone who lives here. I want to jump in and, yeah, I want to add a little bit sort of to this question of what does creative, courageous education on this issue look like? You know, for me, I'm very influenced by the idea of civics education, Right. I think there's some part of us that um, engages in fantasy education when we're what talking is fantasy? about Israel. Wait, break down what fantasy is. Like, tell me what you think that is. Yes. Well, the subject of Israel, period, needs to be integral to Jewish education, first and foremost. 
That's that's kind of where I want to go. It's even if you're living in the United States, even if you feel like, well, I'm not I'm not planning on moving to it, there is a state mm-hmm. of Israel in 2021 with the miracles and messes of what that means. And that is whether one likes it or not a component of being a Jew in America or anywhere in the world. Other people are going to ask you about that aspect of our identity. So I think first and foremost, Israel and thereby the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is an important pillar of Jewish education, period. And I think that we need to get to the point where that's not a controversial or radical thing to say. It just is. And I think right now we don't see that manifest um, in our Jewish educational sphere, some for very good logistical even reasons, time, et cetera. Um, The fantasy is that I think in some ways we allow ourselves to be seduced only by myths, right? And it's the same thing in the story of this country, right? The mythology of the founders and of Thanksgiving, and we're in a moment of reckoning, right? And reconciling the narratives that we grew up with, with what we see as reality today and going through both an individual and collective accounting for that. But that means you're part of a project that's bigger than you. And I think when it comes to Israel education, if we want the next generation to be invested in Jewish community, um, let alone Israel, we need to actually bring in the challenges into education. Personally, creative, courageous education about Israel, period, would, would move away from this fragility of hiding from the challenges. The challenges are the juiciest, most interesting part, and especially to teenagers and college students. Those challenges belie all the big questions. What does it mean to be sovereign? How do you deal with minority populations? How do you reconcile religion and state? What's the place of religious pluralism, et cetera, et cetera? That actually leads me into another question around the state of Israel and like the Israel narrative Mm -hmm. or like the land versus the state. And like, how does all of that get discussed courageously? Mm -hmm. So like, would love to hear y'all break that down for me a little bit. I think that your framing of the question in the first place is already a step beyond what we often do. Right. When we say Israel education, we don't usually break it down. Um, So the first step is really just to ask the question, to name that, that having a connection to Israel doesn't have to mean supporting this specific state or supporting this specific incarnation of what the state looks like right now. Right. 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 I think there's a third piece. Jewish educators, Israel educators, hopefully there's a lot of overlap between the two set as a goal, loving Israel without really digging into what does that mean? First of all, what does it mean to educate people to love, right? I think we can educate people Mm. to connect. But I think it's actually very dangerous when we set as this goal educating to love because it it leads us down this path of the Hasbara, of the sort of propagandist kind of approach because we we idealize, right? We're trying to teach a positive emotion versus if we're trying to teach connection. Right. I think that's already a huge step in the right direction. Unhappy camper. I think there are a lot of takeaways here. One, you're not alone. Your familial problem is part of a systems problem and everything that you think you need to do, we all need to do. And that there are many ways and many reasons and many possibilities around courageous conversations and leading our Jewish future to a place of connection and appreciation of Israel with literacy and with love, because that can love can come with it. Like, I think there was so much that came out of this rich conversation. Yona, Leas, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a really tremendous conversation. And so I really want to appreciate Leah and Yona coming um, on our podcast today. Thanks for the opportunity. So unhappy camper, your question is both particular to your house and the voice of a generation. It's an opportunity for you to open or continue a conversation in your home that's based on shared values and in particular shared Jewish values, because obviously they're at play here. Otherwise, your kids would not care. So hang on to that. Continue the conversation. Let us know how it goes, because as you say, now what is the question 
also of this generation. We know you have questions. Everybody has questions. And some people even have answers. So please send us your questions. We want to answer them and we want to share them with the world. Uh, you can find us at bintel at forward.com or you can even call us and go on at great lengths on our voicemail, which could wind up on the podcast. Pencils out. That number is 201-540-9728. 201-540-9728. I'm Rachel Fishman Federson, publisher and CEO of The Forward. And I'm Jody Rudoran, The Forward's editor in chief. Together, we're reinventing the nation's oldest and largest Jewish news organization for today's diverse American Jewish communities. We're carrying on a 124 year old tradition of exposing anti Semitism, celebrating Jewish books, film, and food, and helping American Jews explore their identities, debate political issues, and connect to their culture. And we're doing those things in new ways that resonate with today's Jews of every type and stripe across generations. But we're a reader-supported nonprofit, and we can't do any of it without you. Please give whatever you can to support independent Jewish journalism by going to forward.com slash donate today. This podcast is a product of The Forward. As you just heard, our editor-in-chief is Jody Budoran, and our CEO and publisher is Rachel Fishman Federson. This show is produced by Wonder Media Network. Our producer is Ira Simonson, and our production assistant is Carmen Borca Carrillo. Our executive producer is Jenny Kaplan. Special, Special thanks, thanks again, again to Edward Blank. Oh, oh. <laughs> I was just having fun. Go ahead. Special thanks again to Edward Blank, whose generosity makes this show possible. Do, 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 do.